uh, it is a great pl pleasure to have James Dahlman to come to our center to present his pioneer work on nanomedicine and lip nanoparticles. So James graduated from biomedical engineering degree at Wright State University and obtained his PhD at MIT and Harvard Medical School and continued to be a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. After that, he became a faculty member and rose to the rank of professor at Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory School of Medicine, and has won um, numerous awards uh, for his uh, work on lip nanoparticles. He also co-founded uh, Guide Therapeutics. So his work focuses on developing lip nanoparticles that can specifically target different cells tissues and organs, and these studies have significant impact on delivering drugs, vaccines, and DNA RNAs uh, to treat various diseases. So uh, let's uh, welcome Jens. Great, thank you, Carol, for having me, and can you confirm you can hear me okay? Uh, yes. Great, excellent. So hi, everybody. Um, hello from Atlanta. Uh, I'm in my backyard right now. Uh, we haven't had the mail delivered yet, and my dogs are in the room, so I didn't want an interruption in the middle of the presentation. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Wish I was there in person. Seattle is one of my favorite cities, uh, but I'm so glad to do it online. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, and go ahead and get into it. Um, all right, so uh, my name is James. I'm associate professor in the McCamish Early Career Professor at Georgia Tech and Emory Medical School in our joint BME Biomedical Engineering Department. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about our efforts to deliver RNA uh, outside the liver. And uh, the way that we do this is by testing thousands and thousands of different nanoparticles, all directly in vivo, which means uh, mice. Um, so for disclosures, I co-founded Guide Therapeutics, which was subsequently acquired by Beam Therapeutics. Um, and I am an advisor for the venture capital firm GV. Um, so. I think that the first thing I want to say here is is perhaps a little controversial, but I just want to say it first because um, I think it's important. Uh, I think we need to reevaluate how we or rethink how we evaluate nanoparticles, um, and hopefully I'll provide a few lines of evidence here that suggest that first statement, which is that you find what you look for. I'm going to give three case studies of that. That you know, in in drug delivery, at least in our hands, you find what you look for. And then the second thing I'm hoping to convince you of today is that we can quantify how thousands of uh, different nanoparticles deliver RNA in vivo. So again, in adult animals uh, with cell type resolution, not just tissue resolution. So the first thing I want to say is, is that gene therapies require teamwork. So today we're going to be focusing on delivery because that's what my lab does. Um, but that doesn't mean the other parts aren't important. Um, the other parts are really important. Uh, we have the payload side, which is, you know, making sure you have really good RNA, whether it's SI or mRNA, making sure it's made with high purity, right chemical modifications, and so on. Our primary point of contact there is a guy named Phil Santangelo, who's at Georgia Tech, who makes a lot of our RNA, and he's a really, really important component to the story. Um, he's on all of our papers, um, but today we're just going to focus on delivery because that's, that's what our lab does. And then second thing I want to highlight, the last part, of course, is the gene target. So, you know, if you can manufacture this stuff and you can protect it, and you have a great delivery vehicle and a great payload, but you have the wrong gene target, you're still not going to succeed. And so we work with people on gene targets um, across a variety of different uh, fields. And uh, if you want to set up a collaboration, usually our collaborations are with gene target people. And then the final thing I want to highlight, again, just highlighting the team here, is that a lot of the data you're going to see has been generated by the four people on the right, Kalina, Melissa, Afsane, and Maureen. Um, yeah, so I've been into RNA therapies for a long time. Um, I've been doing non liver RNA delivery for my entire scientific life, uh, starting as a PhD student. So for 2016, I, I started to notice that, um, some, a really exciting change, which is that the coolest, uh, papers in our field weren't being published in nature anymore. They're being published in, in like New England journal. And that's because this, this field, RNA therapies, was moving into the clinic. And so we're all familiar with the mRNA vaccines. I don't need to explain how transformational those have been. So I just want to take it back a few years earlier to this paper from 2016 showing 
uh, gene silencing in human beings of a gene called uh, PCSK9, or it's actually the activity of PCSK9, after a single administration of this drug called glycerin. Um, and the thing that struck me about this New England Journal article was the not the y-axis. I mean, the y-axis is, is nice and impressive, but it's the x-axis. So you're looking at gene silencing. So this is siRNA. So gene expression should go down if the drug's working. You see the gene expression go down, so the drug's working. But the x-axis is, is pretty incredible. You're getting gene silencing that lasts for six months. And subsequently, in the, over the last year or so, an island has come out and said publicly that uh, they're trying to push for gene silencing that lasts a year so that when you go in for your yearly checkup, you can just get one shot and treat whatever disease you want, again, within your liver. So RNA therapies are here, and I think they're here to stay. Um, when I think about the field of RNA therapy, this is what it kind of looks like to me. You have the uh, intramuscular administrations, um, so the vaccine, so it's essentially local delivery to your immune system. And then you have systemic delivery that's been very successful to hepatocytes in your liver and systemic delivery outside the liver, which we call extra hepatic delivery, um, has been far more challenging. So to my knowledge, um, we have several, even though we have several FDA approvals for systemic uh, liver targeting drugs, there isn't a single uh, RNA therapy that's systemically administered and goes outside the liver that's even made it to with a delivery vehicle that's even made it to phase three. So uh, there really is a need for uh, targeted delivery outside of the liver, and that's that's what we've been doing for over a decade. So if you want to go outside the liver um, and you want to be clinically relevant, I think it's really important to to learn from the people that came before you. Um, you know, the field uh, that I work in now is built on the shoulders of a great a number of biochemists and delivery people that have done amazing work over the last 40 years. And so when I look at uh, the field of nanomedicine and RNA delivery and I say, okay, I, I want to get my stuff outside the liver, the first question that uh, I ask is, well, why has stuff worked inside the liver? And when you ask that question, there's sort of two answers to it. Uh, one is uh, relatively well known within my field, which is that the liver has physical and physiological advantages that result in systemically administered drugs going to the liver. So if you put it in your blood, it's going to go to the liver. People are, I think, relatively aware of that. But there's also uh, a less well-appreciated aspect that I'm highlighting here, which is that starting in the mid-2000s, there was an assay called the Factor Seven assay that came out. And this assay was really good at quickly and efficiently measuring siRNA delivery in animals, in adult animals, in vivo, but only for hepatocytes. It was a hepatocyte-specific sort of medium to high throughput in vivo assay. And using this factor seven assay, a bunch of academic labs and companies started sort of ping-ponging chemistry off of one another. Um, and from 2006, 2014, less than eight years, the, the dose required to deliver siRNA uh, to hepatocytes decreased by like 20,000 fold in eight years because people were looking in vivo in adult animals for hepatocyte delivery. So I think, you know, if you look for hepatocyte delivery, you're going to find hepatocyte delivery. So I think there's a really important history lesson we can take from the pioneers that have successfully developed these liver targeting drugs. And that is by iteratively quantifying how hundreds of nanoparticles uh, deliver RNA to hepatocytes in vivo, the field found clinically relevant delivery to hepatocytes. And so while my lab and then my company before it was acquired focused on is a tweak to that hypothesis, which is that if you iteratively quantify how thousands of different nanoparticles delivered to RNA to any combination of desired cell types in vivo, you may find clinically relevant delivery to those other cell types. So in other words, is this an assay problem? Um, and I think the answer might be yes, in part, could be yes. So I'm going to give three cases, uh, uh, three case studies that sort of support the idea that you find what you look for when it comes to uh, RNA delivery. And the first one is in vitro delivery versus in vivo delivery. So my lab has been pushing uh, this idea of very high throughput in vivo uh, delivery assays uh, for several years now. Um, we published, I think, relatively extensively on this. Uh, and these assays are sort of characterized 
by a few different traits. So one, they're very high throughput. Um, you know, you can say roughly up to 300 different nanoparticles tested in, in one mouse. Uh, they're in vivo. So for now, it's been mice, but we've built a system, and we'll get to this in a moment, uh, that just came out in Nature Nanotech like a week ago that could be used in other species as sort of a species agnostic system. And these things are also functional and iterative. I'll talk about those in a little bit. So again, these are the traits of the high throughput assays that are, are used for in vivo nanoparticle discovery. So the very rough schematic of this um, is that nanoparticle A with chemistry A uh, is formulated to carry DNA barcode A. That's what you see there in pink. And then you make the, take that nanoparticle, you set it aside. Um, and I should say a DNA barcode is just the DNA sequence that we know, that we've designed. And then... You, like I said, you take that nanoparticle A, you set it aside. And then uh, you take nanoparticle B with chemistry B, and you formulate it to carry DNA barcode B, and you set that aside. And you can do this, you know, a few times. Uh, in this example, three. In reality, you could do up to a few hundred. And then you do a quality control step, which isn't shown here. And you administer the particles. You pool them, administer them to mice. And then you isolate the tissues or cell types that you want. And in this toy schematic, if you took out the lungs and... Um, saw a bunch of orange barcode, you would say, oh, for the lungs, nanoparticle C is better than nanoparticle A or B. So you can do these very large uh, experiments. This is what the data set actually looked like. So every row is a different nanoparticle, and the columns are different cell and tissue types. And uh, we're basically just reading out the DNA barcodes with next generation sequencing. Uh, and so you can use NGS to scale up to very large numbers uh, and do entire nanoparticle libraries all at once. And keep in mind that we have the chemical information, so we know exactly what uh, is going into the particles for every particle um, in every row. And so we can take a large data set like this and then extract structure function relationships out of it very quickly. And again, this is all done in vivo. You can also see here one of the key advantages, which is that um, if you want to do really, really detailed uh, on, de on target delivery and off target delivery analysis in the same animal, so you want to hit cell type X and, and you really want to avoid cell type A, B, and C. Um, if you had to do that with 100 animals, it might be pretty hard. Uh, but in our case, you only need a few animals. Uh, and so you can do very, very detailed on and off target analysis because you're only doing, you know, fact sorting or whatever of four mice, not 400 mice. Uh, so this is, this, and you can imagine that you can combine essentially the chemical composition, which is the rows, and the targeting ratios, which is the different columns, and pull out a pretty interesting data set. So this is important for a few reasons. One is that nanoparticles are very chemically diverse. Uh, we just had a review paper come out in Nature Review Genetics that describes some of this stuff. But this is just a schematic. And a typical LMP, even if you ignore targeting ligands uh, and you ignore certain mass ratios, we're going to just put all that stuff to the side. And you just take a very, very simple LMP, uh, an LMP that's similar to the three FDA-approved LMPs right now. Those have four components. They have a cholesterol, um, but they're also, you know, cholesterol variants. So it's actually that blue box is actually way bigger. They have a helper lipid, which in here is the yellow box, and that, that that's here DSPC. But they're, that yellow box in reality is much larger. There's probably 100 different helper lipids. Uh, and they have PEG lipids, which is a polyethylene glycol PEG uh, that's anchored into a lipid nanoparticle with a lipid. And so you have the peg part, the, the linker, and then the lipid part. And you can change any of those three structures. And so there are many, many peg lipids. So that pink box or salmon box or whatever you want to call it, is actually very, very large. And then you have what historically has been the star of the show, which is these ionizable or cationic lipids. Uh, this is what people typically sue each other over is the stuff in the gray box. And these things are also extremely diverse. You can probably synthesize like 20,000 of these. So when you do this math, even if you oversimplify, you can say easily, not just pedantically, not academically, but realistically in the real world, there are four dimensions to this chemical space for an LNP, and you're probably in the tens of billions of combinations. Um, so it, you know, helps to go 100 at a time rather than one at a time. So the second reason why testing everything in vivo quickly uh, is important is, again, comes back to this, you find what you look for story. And that is in vitro delivery, uh, a lot of times is presumed to predict in vivo delivery. And I think when you say that out loud, it, you realize, oh, maybe that isn't the best assumption we should make. But if you read papers in the nano, in nano medicine field, 
I think about every paper you read in the nanomedicine field. If it's a five figure paper, it goes in vitro, in vitro, in vitro, in vitro, in vivo, or maybe in vitro, in vitro, in vitro, in vivo, in vivo. But you're always designing and screening and optimizing in cell culture and then taking the best thing and putting it into the animal. So whether or not we want to admit it, we are saying as a field that the in vitro delivery assays are predicting the activity in vivo. So when you actually put that to the test, um, you get kind of an interesting result. So this is uh, the experiment sort of started it all for us where we took the same group of particles, uh, all barcoded particles. So we did about 400 particles made on the same day. And we administered these particles to either cell lines, primary cells, or to the animals. And then we fax sort of the same cell types out of the animals at the same time point. So it was comparing in vitro and in vivo delivery as directly as you possibly could. And what we found is when you ran a control experiment, when you did in vitro delivery on the x-axis, and then in vivo delivery on the y-axis, every dot here is a particle, and the na naked barcode is a negative control. Um, so what you saw is the naked barcode, the naked control didn't work, which is exactly what we expected. And you saw that in vitro delivery of 100 particles or so plotted against in vitro delivery at a slightly higher dose of 100 particles so it was totally predictive. So cell culture delivery predicts cell culture delivery. But when you take the same exact thing and you look at in vitro versus in vivo, you get no relationship at all. And we've seen this in every single experiment we've ever run, at least for systemic delivery. So when you think about this figure, it's actually a bit of an existential figure, in my opinion, because for 30 years, people like me have said, uh, so I'm not going to you know, shove blame around without taking it on some myself. You know, people, including me, have said that, oh, we're going to optimize everything uh, using the x-axis in order to help out, help us out on the y-axis. And you can see here that that may not be a great idea. Um, the other thing I want to highlight about this is that the poor delivery relationship cuts both ways. So it is often the case that particles that work in vitro do not work in the animal. I think we've all experienced that in, in the nanomedicine field. You do a year of optimization in cell culture and then the thing doesn't work in the animal. But it cuts the other way. So our most efficient delivery vehicle to date in vivo does not work at all in cell culture. So you actually, it, it really does cut both ways, unfortunately. Um, so, so far, this number is underestimated. We, we've, we're now well above 4,000, but we've tested many, many thousands of particles in vivo. Um, so I just want to highlight one last thing about these assays, which is that they're functional. Um, so you can sort of think about delivering two ways. One is where does the particle go? It's distribution. And that would be represented at the top here. So in that case, nanoparticle one gets to the cell, but doesn't get in. Nanoparticle two gets into the cell, but gets stuck in the endosome. Nanoparticle three gets out of the endosome, does its job. And if you're reading this out as a biodistribution assay, where do the particles go? All three particles are going to be read out the same. And that may not be what you want. Um, instead, what you want is, is sort of the bottom, which is the functional screen. And in this type of screen, nanoparticle one, which gets to the cell but doesn't get in, and nanoparticle two, which gets into the cell but stuck in the endosome, you don't read them out. All you read out is nanoparticle three, which actually delivers the stuff into the cytoplasm. And we have a number of functional assays functional barcoding assays. And the one that was previously the workhorse assay was called fast identification of nanoparticle delivery or FIND. So the way that FIND works is you take nanoparticle one with chemistry one, put in barcode one and Cree mRNA, and then nanoparticle N with barcode N gets Cree mRNA. You make it your library, do all the quality control stuff. And then you administer these Cree uh, uh, barcoded particles uh, to AI-14 mice or AI-9s or whatever. And these mice, have a lock stop locks TD tomato construct, which means that if the uh, Cree mRNA is not functionally delivered, so if the Cree mRNA is not made into Cree protein, which then goes next size of the stop codon, uh, the cells don't do anything. The cells have no color to them. But if the mRNA is translated into Cree protein and that Cree protein does go into the nucleus next size of the stop codon, the cells are going to turn red. And so you can basically put the pool of uh, Cree particles in and fax sort TD tomato positive lung cells and TD tomato positive hepatocytes and TD tomato positive uh, splenic macrophages and whatever you want. And in each one of those uh, tubes, you can then sequence. And so then you get uh, the barcodes that are associated with cells where functional delivery occurred. So the fine assay historically has been the workhorse assay um, for a lot of stuff that we've done. 
uh, and has now been, you know, was adopted in to my startup company and now has even this, this sort of approach has even made it into some of Beam's uh, decks now. So it, it has been validated pretty extensively, I'd say. So we use this stuff all the time, and this is how we use it. We'll, say, we'll take a library. In this case, we tested 75 different LMPs, and we varied the structure of the cholesterol. So instead of using regular cholesterol, we used 20 alpha hydroxy or 25 hydroxy or whatever. And then we said, okay, well, we want to test all of them in vivo all at the same time. And we did. And then the barcoding results came out, and this is what you get. And the barcoding results gives you uh, a prediction. It says 20 alpha hydroxy should be better than regular cholesterol. Now, and the, here, you know, I, I would say that we don't treat this as gospel, meaning that we don't just go publish this. Uh, we, we simply treat the screening data as a way to generate a hypothesis, and then we test that hypothesis with individual particles. Uh, so I'll say that again. The workflow, if you read, ever read one of our papers, is always the same. It's, hey, we think this might be important, you know, so we're going to test it. We're going to make this big library to test it. And we did the screen, and the screen says that A should be better than B. And then we go test A and B individually. So the screen just makes the predictions, which we then go have to validate using individual particles. Um, okay, so this screen said 20 alpha hydroxy should be better than regular cholesterol. And sure enough, when you take an LNP um, and formulate it with 20 alpha hydroxy, and then take that same LNP, and the only thing you change is you is you swap out 20 alpha for regular cholesterol, and you put it in, and you inject, you see a huge drop in delivery. And this was a very low dose. This is 0 0.05 megs per keg, 0 0.05 megs per keg. So you're looking at really, really low doses uh, of delivery. Um, and if you go back to the screen, the screen predicts 20 alpha is going to be better than cholesterol, and that's what we see in the individual particle. So uh, again, if you think about doing this in your own labs, um, definitely use the right controls. And then also, uh, don't treat your screening data as gospel. Uh, go and confirm what the screening data predict. So we find, again, all the time, here's some unpublished stuff. We were going for lung this time instead of liver, and we are really trying to maximize the lung divided by liver ratio. And we uh, tested, I think, 130 different LMPs um, in vivo, and we found this LMP that we call lung one. And when you take LMP lung one and you put cream RNA into it, you can get a bunch of the lung lights up. So here's a picture of a glowing lung. Uh, and then when you go quantify uh, gene editing mediated by this lung, so you swap out the cream RNA and instead take uh, LMP lung one and formulate it to carry Cas9 mRNA and guide, you get lung editing far more than you get uh, liver editing as you would predict from the screen. Okay, so basically we've run these assays at a very high throughput. Uh, and one of the things we learned from them is that in vitro delivery and in vivo delivery are very different. So you find what you look for. The second thing, uh, the second you find what you look for story is species variation. And this is a paper that just came out last week. Um, we developed a species agnostic uh, nanoparticle delivery screen, which is called SANS, species agnostic nanoparticle delivery screening. And this system doesn't require those crew reporter mice. So it doesn't require the AF14s or AI9s which means you can put them in fancy mice, or later on down the line, you can imagine doing this in primates. So in our first study, um, we uh, first uh, published demonstration of this. We took a pool of barcoded particles, so nanoparticle one, chemistry one gets barcode one, and this AVHH reporter construct. Nanoparticle N with barcode N gets, uh, uh, sorry, nanoparticle N with chemistry N gets barcode N, and that same reporter construct. We put the same pool of big particle, same big pool of particles, into um, all sorts of mice. So we had humanized mice, which are mice that have partial mouse, partial human livers. We had primatized mice, which are mice that have partial primate, partial mouse livers. And then as a control, we had murinized mice, which are the mice that undergo the same procedures but only have mouse cells. Um, and then we had a bunch of wild type strains as well. And so what you find here is that, uh, and I need to walk through this data a little slowly here just to make sure it's, it's clear as to what's going on. The red bar is the human or primate cells within those mixed mice. So, you know, the red bar um, in the human category here is the human, eye, is the human cells from the humanized mouse. Um, the gray bar next to it is the mouse hepatocytes from the humanized mice. So remember those, 
Because humanized mice have livers that have both human and mouse cells. So again, red bar is human cells from the humanized mouse. Gray bar next to it is mouse cells from the humanized mouse. Same thing with primatized. So red bar is primate cells from the primatized mice. Gray is the mouse cells from the primatized mice. And then you have the murinized control here and then black six. And what you see here is that uh, the mouse controls all behave similarly, which is what you would expect. So all of those mice look the same. Um, and the two cell types that behave differently are the humanized cells and the primatized cells. Uh, so that was one line of evidence that suggested you might have some uh, species dependent delivery. And goodness, the, advantage, the disadvantage of being outside is that I hear um, a bit of noise in the background. So I'm gonna hop inside real quick if you don't mind, uh, cause I can hear some yard work going on across the street. Just one moment. Okay, um, sorry about that, guys. So the um, second line of evidence that we found of species-dependent delivery uh, is shown here. So what we did was, remember, we're testing about 90 particles at once. Uh, and so what we're able to do here is plot uh, how well all 90 particles did across the different species. And so what you see here is the R-squared value. Uh, for uh, primatized hepatocytes plotted against uh, the part of the same particles, but in the humanized mice. And you see the R-squared value is actually pretty good. It's 0.83. So not, not exactly perfect, but, but pretty good. And then when you go run those same assays, but now you're looking at um, the mouse cells on the Y-axis and then the human cells on the X-axis, you see the R squared value is actually a lot lower, 0 0.53. So, you know, it's not like mice are terrible, but there is a difference between the primates uh, and the mice uh, in a way that frankly is believable to me. Uh, so there's a second line of evidence that you might see species uh, dependent delivery. And then the last thing you might point, correctly point out is that, hey, James, like this is kind of, you know, it's, it's a little biased here because these data sets that you're showing are our squared values. You're, you're looking at all the data, including particles that are terrible. And um, sorry, you'll hear my pit bull squeaking. I apologize for this, guys. Um, but in reality, uh, when we go uh, try to find particles, you do your screens in mice, uh, and then you take your top particles. So you're not looking at all the terrible ones, you're looking at your top ones. So what we did there to make sure that that was consistent, we, was we did exactly what we normally do, which is we looked how the top 10 uh, particles behaved. And so if you take the top 10 particles uh, from mouse cells, which is the top row there, so humanized M is the mouse cells, and you, and you plot them and you rank them one to 10, and then you take and you say, okay, well, how will those particles do in the human cells? You actually see there's a big difference. But when you run this analysis with primatized uh, 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 particles, so the particles that did really well in the primate cells, and you ask how well they do in human, you see almost an exact overlap. So again, this isn't just a statistical trick that we pulled and got our squared value differences. This also is, is sort of real in terms, it's also different in terms of how we do it in the real world. And then finally, um, I don't have time to go into this in too much detail, uh, but uh, we were able to go and look at mechanism and identify uh, some genes that were differentially expressed that could, not guaranteed to be the same, but could uh, explain uh, the species dependent uh, differences. So uh, the last um, story I want to tell you is, uh, second last story I should say, is you find what you look for route of administration. So this is a Nature BME paper that came out a few weeks ago. Um, that's actually incorrect. I think it was 2021. I apologize for that. So I'll get to the, the end first. The, the, the last figure shows that you can take this nanoparticle uh, that we call nebulized lung delivery one, NLD1, uh, formulated to carry mRNA that encodes a therapeutic antibody and protect against a pandemic flu. So all the NLD1 treated mice uh, survive and five out of six of the uh, untreated mice die from the pandemic flu. And so th that's the tagline of the paper, but in reality as a delivery person, I wanna to talk to you about what I find a bit more interesting. So one of the things that we were thinking about was 
could you you know screen uh, LMPs in vivo uh, without uh, the use of barcodes? Uh, and that would be useful because not every chemistry lab is is you know adept at NGS and, and sequencing prep and stuff like this. And so what we did was we we developed this multivariate approach where we said okay. Imagine that there are three different, again, oversimplified example here, but let's say that the, you hypothesize there are three LMP traits that could affect stuff, uh, size, charge, and whatever. You, you make it up. You visualize the chemical space um, as a three-dimensional box, and you go into each corner of the box, and you formulate a small pool, administer that small pool, if it's stable, uh, two mice directly with nebulization, directly with nebulization, and then you evaluate the groups. And in this concept, if, uh, if the blue group does well, then you go in and you make a bigger expanded library around the blue group, and then you do this iterate this, you do this iteratively. But the key is that you do all the screening uh, with nebulization if you're going to look for nebulization. And so doing this, we tested 110 LNPs, um, of which 54 made the criteria and were nebulized in vivo, and we found some design traits uh, that uh, have we've now used in, in uh, NLD2, which is the second generation, and now just today we found an NLD3, a third generation compound, um, and those design traits have continued to hold up. Um, but this is the most important figure. So this is, uh, you know, I think in the paper it's like 4F or something. It's kind of buried, but to me this is the most important figure. What this is is NLD1 uh, uh, protein expression after um, it's administered from, from nebulization, or through nebulization, and it's compared to 7C3, CKK12, and MC3, which are three really, really extensively validated particles that were found uh, through in intravenous screening or through intravenous methods of some sort. So these are really, really solid, really solid particles for systemically administered um, uh, RNA. Uh, so these are compounds that took years, you know, months to years to make, and they've been optimized and all this stuff. But they weren't optimized. They weren't op, uh, optimized for nebulization. They were optimized for IV. And then we compared it to NLD1, which we found, frankly, in four weeks, basically, uh, using nebulization. And it turns out that for nebulization, NLD1 wins by a landslide. Which is to say that in nebulized in LMPs are not designed in the same way as systemic LMPs. Which means, again, you find what you look for. If you're looking for IV, you need to be screening in vivo IV. And if you're looking for nebulization, you need to be screening in vivo with nebulization. So with that, I, I want to share for the first time publicly a, a paper that isn't out yet, but should be out in a week or so. And it's a bit of a departure for us. Um, so this is a different story, um, but I just think it's interesting. So um, the concept here is that um, Phil Santangelo and I, so I'm going back here to, to, uh, to highlight this. Phil Santangelo, as I said, is sort of my, my RNA guy. And um, let's see how I do this. All right, there we go. And he and I have been talking a lot about non-liver delivery, for years about non-liver delivery. And we agree that it is very unlikely an LNP will be perfectly non-liver. Um, I, I don't see how that's physically possible, to be honest with you. Meaning you're always going to have unwanted liver delivery. Now, you can have an LMP that has a favorable non-liver to liver ratio, but you're never going to drive liver down to zero. And so Phil, again, who does designer mRNA, he and I have been talking a lot about how we can engineer the RNA itself or design of the constructs to sort of selectively promote delivery outside the liver. So, you know, you help out the delivery system. You help out the delivery system, and you do this in a way that um, we call stacking, um, which really means that uh, you're giving the you're having the payload uh, promote non-liver delivery uh, as well. Now we're not the only ones who've done this. There's actually a bunch of other gene therapy groups that have done this, and the approach that you take actually varies a lot with the payload. So with an RNA, you know, if you're doing a DNA thing, you can do promoter engineering, 
But in this case, we don't have a promoter. So uh, we have to do it to the RNA itself. So, uh, and of course, we it's like the Swiss cheese model that we've all been very familiar with with COVID stuff, right? So same thing, except we're trying to minimize liver delivery. So the way that we've done this is we have designed inhibitory oligos, which we call I oligos, that block Cas9. Uh, and so what you can do, as you'll see in a moment, is sort of administer these oligos right to the liver, and they act as off switches. And so you can sort of pre-treat the liver with uh, off switches, uh, thereby uh, driving down uh, the liver delivery. Um, and so this is the mechanism. Um, these I oligos bind uh, to the three prime end of the guide RNA um, and essentially uh, prevent interactions uh, that or prevent RNP formation. Um, and as a result, uh, you get uh, less uh, Cas9 activity when these things are around. So th this was a big departure for us. You know, you're doing a bunch of biochemistry, you're doing a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, that uh, uh, you're not, um, we're not super familiar with. Uh, uh, otherwise in the lab. So this is what the iLegal looks like. Again, we haven't kind of talked about this yet, but this is what the iLegal looks like. It's about a 20 mer and it binds to the very, very end. We tried other iLegos as well, uh, but they didn't quite work quite as well. This works with sort of a toehold uh, type approach, uh, which we outlined in the paper. And uh, this is just an example of, the, of this kind of working. So what we do here, just, you know, you have to forgive me, the, the experiments are a bit complicated, but you take a uh, I, the, this iligo and you administer it to the liver in some way. So you can do that with a lipid nanoparticle or a galnac or whatever, but you pre-treat the animal uh, with the iligo in a way that it goes to the liver. So in this case, we use a hepatocyte targeting LMP. So the iligo goes to hepatocytes and then you wait a little while and then you can administer your Cas9 stuff. And then what you'll find here on the right is that you see a dramatic drop, um, or uh, excuse me, about a 50% drop uh, in indels within hepatocytes and no drop within your target cell, uh, lung endothelial cells. So in this case, you're driving up the ratio, the effective ratio of lung to liver editing. Now you can also couple this with other techniques and you'll see why we can do this easily in a moment. So iLego can also be coupled with rationally designed Cas9 mRNAs. And so Phil's lab made up these Cas9 mRNAs where the UTRs have five different SIGFP binding sites. And it could be SI whatever you wanted. In this case, we just took a SIGFP that was validated. And so that you can separately treat things with SIGFP, again, in, in the liver, thereby driving down Cas9 expression in the liver and attack uh, Cas9 uh, expression uh, from the mRNA side, All right? So the iLegal can attack it from the illegal, from the sgRNA side, and the uh, SI can attack it from the mRNA side, and both are deliverable with something like Galnac, right? So because these are small ligos, uh, you can deliver the I ligo uh, or the siRNA with Galnac into the liver and attack this thing from both ends, uh, so to speak, the mRNA and the sgRNA side. Um, so that paper will be out in like, like I said, a week or so. Um, but the thing I wanna highlight here is that all of these efforts are really focused on non-liver delivery uh, and sort of to summarize this stuff, you know, I, I think I think the stacking idea, again, we're not the only ones doing this. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. But outside of that, I, I think as a nanomedicine person specifically, we need to uh, rethink how we evaluate nanoparticles. And I really want to highlight that over and over and over and over again, we keep finding uh, that you, you basically find what you look for. Um, if you are looking in vitro, it's gonna be hard to find stuff that works in vivo. Uh, there's species to species variation that might uh, play a role and the route of administration matters. So the way I kind of think about this is that, um, you know, in nanoparticle delivery, we have this sort of silly saying, which is that proxies are poison, right? So you really wanna to get to uh, the closest representation of what you're trying to do as early as you can. Uh, even small changes uh, in your screening process relative to what you're trying to get at um, can cause major problems on the line. And then um, we can also now quantify thousands of nanoparticles in vivo with cell type resolution. And I always like to plug that at the very bottom. Uh, my lab is growing by quite a, a number of people this year. And so we are hiring uh, folks at all levels, uh, masters, technician, PhD, and postdoc. Uh, and so if you're interested in some of this stuff or you have some expertise in AAV, we have some cool new viral stuff that uh, we're just getting off the ground. Uh, come down to Atlanta, it's lovely. Um, we'd love to have you down here.
Um, so with that, this is probably the most important slide. There's Phil on the left. He's a really, really important contributor, he, like hugely great teammate. Um, Eric is one of our gene target people, John Robox, another gene target person. Uh, and I've been very fortunate to join on some of their grants. Uh, and then key members on the left and then the lab here on the right and folks who've been funding us. So with that, um, I would just want to say one last thing, which is that we've, we're trying to sort of push this idea that that big data and sort of omics -y type things can be used to improve nanotech. Uh, and we have new technologies that should be coming out this year that are along these lines of barcodes is sort of the first generation. Um, but here's our sort of one of our vision, uh, this sort of uh, a vision for how this could work. So I just want to highlight that uh, and I will stop sharing. So thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, James. Um, so um, I think we're going to start the Q&A session now. Uh, please just uh, yeah, turn on your mic and video and, and you can ask questions. I think that's more straightforward. Thank you, James. That's that's a wonderful talk. Of course. Hey, Bruce. Go ahead. Very, very nice talk. I really appreciate it, especially the in vivo aspects. If you customize your chemical space to look at things other than liver and have, and what kind of, you know, different compounds do you find, say, targeting bone marrow or spleen? Is it, you know, the compound as a chemical space much different that you see and how much different is it just generally? Yeah, sure. So um, I would say two things here. One, um, a lot of the existing academic literature has been liver focused. And I think there's a history for that. Uh, there's a historical reason for that. Um, I think people viewed it, uh, the people I've spoken with that were sort of there at the time uh, viewed it as the first organ to be targeted. And so it was the primary focus. So if you go and you, in, in, if you look sort of in the chemical space and the IP space around those liver targeting vehicles, it's actually quite crowded, quite crowded. Um, but what's interesting is that if you, if you go and you say, okay, how does that sort of liver targeting lipid space um, compare to all possible lipids, you know, that would have a chance of working? You know, so not theoretically all lipids in the world, but, you know, lipids that you would actually might be worth trying. Um, it's a very small fraction. So oh, wow. very small fraction. So if you kind of go outside of that canonical space, um, there's all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, in the company and in my lab, uh, whenever we identify uh, a new chemical space, uh, I, I'd say we've identified uh, probably two new chemical spaces that are truly new, uh, and then a th one of which has been reported, one we're writing now, and a third I'm still, we're still early on. So I'd say three. They're, they're different, and um, it, it makes sense to me that um, the ones that, that truly do behave differently are sort of out there chemically uh, speaking, relative to the previously reported compounds. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it does. So have you ever incorporated, say, specific kinds of protein recognition moieties into your, into your lipids to actually increase the, you know, targeting or the address, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. So we haven't, um, we haven't, but that's in large part because I'm not a great conjugate chemist and and there's certain acids you have to run to make sure whatever ligand you're using, whether it's, you know, uh, something small uh, or full on antibody or some sort of aptamer, that's all, you know, that is pointed in the right direction. For example, if they're like pointing out, not pointing in or, or. So there are people who are really good at that. I'm not one of those people. And so um, we haven't moved in that space yet, but um, I'm certainly not opposed uh, to moving in that space in the future, we just have to get some different chemists on board. Same thing with so, polymers and stuff like that. So you could, can you put something on the outside so that you could use click chemistry to basically bind moieties on the outside of your lipids, your lipid yeah, we, vesicle? We're just, start, we're just starting to move in this direction. So I'm very fortunate at Georgia Tech. Uh, our, uh, I'm not I'm not in chemistry, but our chemistry chair is a guy named M.G. Finn, who used to be at Scripps, and he He's is one friend. of the... Oh really? Oh yeah. So yeah. MG's the man, right? And and yeah. so yeah. he's my he's my chemistry uh, mentor here, and 
if you know MG, you know how fortunate I am to say that. So, and so he's, absolutely, you know, one of, absolutely. Yes. Very energetic. Yes. Yeah, he's amazing. So, you know, we're, uh, anyway, so MG and I are working on some stuff now. Yeah. They're great talk. Really great talk. I'll shut Thank up you. for a while and let other, other folks talk. <laughs> You super, might be the only one. I mean, we, <laughs> so it's all right. So, super great talk. It, it's uh, awesome what you're doing there. I think it, it's neat. Um, I have a quick question. So this is uh, Rich James. This is kind of a minor question and maybe off target a little bit, but. Um, Was that pun intended or unintended? Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, um, so the, have you guys looked at putting microRNA sequences in the like liver specific microRNA sequences in the Cas9 or, you know, in the, the RNA targeting thing in order to kind of do the skewing and does that work? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we haven't yet, but that's one of the, that's, I think we've written grants that say we're going to do it. Um, there's been a bunch of this work, um, you know, we're, we're not the first ones to do this stuff. So, yeah. You know, Moderna has done this stuff they published on microRNA sites. I think that like a MIR-122 site, if I recall um, correctly, um, that they published. Uh, and so, you know, I think, uh, so long story short, we haven't, but we could. Um, Phil's kind of a mRNA whiz, so we can stick whatever we'd like uh, in those sites. Uh, we did the synthetic sites uh, in large part because we were wondering whether... Um, uh, Essentially, like it, it, what we thought was okay, since we're going to use Galnac in theory to deliver the IL egos anyway, you could use in Galnac's therapeutic index is essentially infinite. I'm joking a little bit, but there's a huge therapeutic index. Couldn't you just, you know, throw in some SI and just like dose the crap out of like just put a ton of SIGFP in there? And then that way you have a ton of that off switch and it might be higher than the endogenous MIR 122. Again, Forgive me if it's not MIR-122, but whatever that liver-specific microRNA is. Yeah, it doesn't it matter. Be, yeah, it doesn't matter. It might be higher than the endogenous levels of that liver-specific microRNA, and that, that was the idea. But, you know, using the endogenous okay. microRNAs is another one that people have done before. Yeah, thanks. Of course. Thanks. Hey, James. Um, Hello. Great talk. Always amazing to see the stuff that you guys are doing. Um, did, are, do you see innate responses to the RNAs in in the cells that you deliver? Yeah. Is, so is it like specific to certain cell types? Do you know what do you know about that? Yep. So um, we are very cognizant of innate responses um, in large part because we think even uh, minor uh, changes in uh, uh, minor uh, activation of the innate system can completely shut down delivery. So we had um, another advanced materials paper I couldn't talk about, didn't have time to talk about today, where very small um, amounts of, for instance, TLR4 activation um, takes mRNA delivery from, you know, X to zero, not even like cuts it by half, I mean, it drops to zero. And so we're, we're hyper cognizant of that. Phil's mRNAs are pretty good. They, he cleans them up really well and so on, but he'll be the first to tell you that, you know, we need to monitor this stuff. What, yeah. are, the, what are the modifications that he does? Just Oh, goodness. So he's doing all the classics. So he does different caps, pseudouridine. Um, uh, yeah, he, he's been in the mRNA modification game for, um, I jokingly say, since way before it was cool. I mean, I mean he's been in it for years. And so he his lab is actually... It's pretty amazing to have him on campus because he's essentially an mRNA manufacturing lab, uh, just as an academic. Um, so, but he 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 does. But anyway, he's been very very good at developing assays for like the rig eye stuff and all the TLRs and PKR activation and so on. So, um, so we we do a lot of that. And the last thing I'll say is that we're now developing in my lab uh, approaches that combine delivery and in single cell RNA sequencing in large part to see, because uh, you can basically take the endogen the mRNA that you're delivering and then, you know, measure its, uh, the amount of it that you put into the cell along with the rest of the transcriptome and then see how cell state affects stuff. So we have a bunch of papers under review now that use that technique 
And um, we think there is increasing evidence that, again, even slight uh, uh, activation of the innate system uh, can screw up the amount of protein that you make per unit mRNA you put into the cell. So yeah, it, it's very interesting. A, re a related thought to that, like, have you guys seen differences in in the amount of protein that gets produced, and I guess the innate responses um, when you just change the code, like the sequence, the codon optimization of the of the RNA you're delivering. So I, you know, that's See probably a better. Qu that's probably a better question for. I know Phil has done that, but I just don't know the answer. Um, but I, I know Phil has done that. Yeah. But that might be a where where you look situation too. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. That's true. I mean, it, it's funny. I, I just think the more and more I think about it, the you, you know, I'll say a few things. You know, the last two years has shown that mRNA therapeutics, if you get them right, can be pretty interesting. And I'm increasingly uh, of the opinion that we need to be focusing our efforts both chemically in terms of what we're testing uh, and in terms of how we're running the assays on things that really have a chance of, of, of you know, making really meaningful clinical predictions as best we can in preclinical models. And um, I know it's a bit of a broad statement to make, but we think a lot about the mRNA quality, the purification, um, you know, Phil's really good at, for instance, getting rid of any kind of double-stranded RNA byproduct, which can set off innate stuff. So there, there's, we think about this, this sort of thing quite a bit, all the way down to code and optimization, although I don't, I don't do that, Phil does it. So um, we're really doing our best to, to make the data sets as relevant as we can, again, given that we're in clinical, preclinical species. So, so, oh, go ahead, Carol. Sorry. So, uh, James, you have the, uh, I, I, I'm, I think the stacking strategy that you mentioned is it's really very interesting. So, so use these inhibitory oligos. So, how how big are these I oligo? These are DNA oligos, right? Uh, they're they're mixed. They're, they're DNA, but they're modified. Um. So we do the whole chemical modification thing. We did the whole like, you know, is this RNA H dependent stuff and doing different mod patterns and and things like this. They're about twenty mers, so they're 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 small, single stranded twenty mer, uh, roughly twenty mer. Um, and so we we made them. We had a whole panel where we you know made different um, uh, different chemical modification patterns and so on to see which ones work the best and blah blah blah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think one of the things that struck us about this work is, you know, again, we're not the first ones to do essentially anti CRISPRs, right? I mean, there's a ton of anti CRISPRs out there, uh, really exciting stuff. Um, what I think is interesting about our system is that it, it's essentially anti CRISPR that you can actually deliver, uh, just like any other illegal. Uh, so, you know, if you have an anti CRISPR protein, super exciting, but from, in, from an in vivo standpoint, I don't. It, it's harder for me to deliver that um, than it would be for this very, very small, um, you know, uh, RNA. So anyway, I, I think it's an interesting system. We really were inspired by a lot of that anti-CRISPR protein stuff, like the ACR protein stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I also think that these, these ILEGOs can be further optimized, frankly. Um, I think we're kind of at step one for them. Uh, I think there's a lot to be done in terms of ratios, timing, and and modification patterns. There's a lot to be done, but it's all doable. It's, there's there's nothing, it's just like, there's sort of a ground, there's already sort of a, a pathway laid out. We just have to do the work. But these are actually RNA, RNA not DNA, or they're, you said they're mixed? No, mm -hmm. they can be mixed, but again, the chemical modification pattern and the types of nucleotides that they are, are isn't settled yet, is what I'm trying to say. So there, there's, this is a first generation construct, but it's, it's not, um, it's not, uh, it's the first step of the story. So do you have to deliver this into the cytoplasm or does it have to go to the nucleus? It doesn't. Um, so my, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I know that um, based on the in vivo delivery I've seen and kind of the doses that we needed to achieve whatever, my guess is that this works in the cytoplasm. Um, the other reason I think it works in the cytoplasm is if you preform 
so we did a bunch of fundamental biochemistry. And I want to shout out David Lockery, who's a postdoc in my lab, who's an RNA, RNA uh, postdoc, because I, I wouldn't know how to do this stuff. So David came into my lab and did some like actual biochemistry. And um, one of the assays that we ran was uh, whether this ILEGO can bust open uh, a preformed RNP or not. And it does not. So um, if you have a preformed RNP at some concentration, I think you need like a hundred fold higher concentration of ILEGO to see any kind of reduction in cutting. But if you have, if they're not preformed yet, mm -hmm. then the ILEGO can still work. And so to me, that would suggest that this is probably happening in the cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. uh, the ILEGO sitting there, the sgRNA, remember, it doesn't need to be made, it's delivered. So while the mRNA is getting turned into protein, before the RNP can form, the ILEGO is finding the guide, binding to it, and then preventing the formation once the protein is made. Now, I don't have in vivo data to support that. That's just based on the biochemistry and the doses that we saw. So sort of two lines of orthogonal evidence, but not conclusive. Great, thanks. Go ahead, David, sorry. Um, I wanted to kind of ask sort of a, kind of a stupid question maybe, but the, um, you know, your approach of screening everything in vivo with the libraries is really cool. Um, you know, from the perspective of people who work on hematopoietic cells, it would be great to screen libraries ex vivo yep. and try to identify lineage specific ways to deliver with with LN, LNPs that are like targeted. Have you tried that sort of an approach and or what's the status of that kind of work? Yeah, so not yet with the ex vivo stuff in large part because we didn't have the screening system set up. So, you know, these these screening systems were were great with Cree reporters but then you would need a Cree responsive something, something. And a lot of times for HSCs, people want to do primary cells and then you'd have to take a primary cell and not make it primary anymore because then you have to transduce it with a Lenny that would express a key, you know, a reporter, or excuse me, a Cree reporter construct. It was going to be a nightmare. So we basically didn't do it. And then, um, and then uh, this SAN system uh, came along. And of course, in the paper, we highlight the fact that, you know, we're hoping in the future to get into NHPs, but, um, you know, so we did humanize mice and primatized mice, but let's be honest, it'd be great to do it in an NHP directly. Um, the uh, thing we didn't talk about, um, but I think it's sort of implied is stuff like what you just described, which is, you know, you could do primary human cells, you could do um, even tissue explants, you could do all sorts of stuff that doesn't need any special constructs. So we've had one or two groups even approach us about doing you know, surgeons who say, hey, I'm taking out, you know, um, lung tumors and, um, you know, and uh, they have, we always end up taking some residual lung tissue around it and we can hook it up to these like pumps. I don't really know the details, but would you want to screen in those? And we're like, yeah, you know, if you're going to take it out anyway, you know, we'd love to. So there's all sorts of stuff that we can do. Uh, we just haven't had the time to do it yet. But uh, I, that's why that species agnostic system I think is going to be really important for the future because it, it just gets you out of needing a, a, a locked a Cree lock system. Thanks. Of course. All right, great. That, that might be I ask, James, can I ask one more that is sort of yeah, relevant? Yeah, sure, David, go ahead. Do your thing. I was going to probably ask you the same thing when we talk, but um, have you combined any of this with um, with DNA delivery templates, small ones, ODNs, or or um, like or, uh, have, you have collaborations doing that? Or we haven't yet. We we've had, we've struggled with. Um, we've done a few DNA projects, you know, that are sort of focused on large gene delivery. You know, we want to. Uh, um, you know, we want to deliver a factor, you know, do, do the gin bio thing. And um, those haven't been very successful because the DNAs that we are given um, are not well tolerated. So I'll just put it into a normal nano, like MC3, which is like nanoparticle 101. 
for people like us. And then I do all the injections in my lab still myself, or not all of them. I do some of the injections in my lab still. I like to monitor how the mice react. And, you know, you put in uh, MC3 with DNA in it and the mice like heals over. And I've never seen that happen in my life. So, and those were from certain organizations that swore up and down that their DNA was great and this and that. And then I put it in a super moderate dose and the mouse is having trouble. So I've been a little skeptical of that type of DNA stuff. And, you know, once I have a DNA that doesn't um, do that to the animal, I'll be happy to test stuff. I just haven't um, seen that yet. And then, um, but I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure it's coming. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say is that all DNAs, as you know, aren't created equal. And so I think it, it is going to be different, especially for people who are interested in like HDR stuff. You know, it, it's going to be very, it's going to be very different um, potentially to put in some sort of template. Uh, uh, that's going to be different from sticking in this like giant honking, you know, thing. So I, I, I think, so I, I just want to highlight that about the DNA experiences we've had so far, but also acknowledge that one, people are working on making these big things perhaps safer. And two, the small things do not equal the big things. So that, that's how I kind of think about it. Yeah, I, I think in that aspect that James and I talked earlier and and, and we all felt like uh, if the DNA was, it can be delivered, I think it can be delivered very efficiently because judging from the MRA results. So into the cytoplasm, but it's probably quite toxic if it cannot enter the nucleus right away, because yep. Um, yep. so it, it creates a lot of high cell stress. So, so it's yep. very toxic to the animals. Yep, that's a problem with the DNA. Yep. yep. I have a naive question. When you deliver, does it does it? How does a particle get in? Does it go through an endosomal pathway, non-endosomal pathway? or it depends on what's on the outside of the particle? Um, I, I think most of our stuff goes in through endosomal pathways. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, in most of the time, you know, most of the pathways that we'll see up, upregulated, you know, for instance, when we're doing sequencing stuff, is some combination of caviol and clathrin. So, so very similar to what other people, other people see. Um, so I, you know, um, sometimes I'll get asked, because uh, our particles do, sort of uh, demonstrate tropisms uh, without targeting ligands that people aren't accustomed to seeing. And I'll get asked, well, you know, basically, well, what makes your particle so special? And, and my answer is, well, nothing. Um, where I think we're just kind of looking, we're just kind of looking in, in a certain way. And so we're able to find things that, that go in. Um, but so far there haven't been any um, sort of magical mechanisms. Um, so we haven't seen any situations where a particle um, goes in uh, into a cell where you would expect endocytosis to occur, and, and we don't observe endocytosis. We haven't had anything like that happen. They're actually uh, pretty boring particles in the sense that um, they behave um, uh, pretty normally, except for the fact that you have difference in relative tropism. And, and if you block kind of the endosomal pathway, you don't get efficient delivery. Yeah, so it depends on the particle. So, for instance, we have a particle now where we did a bunch of, um, and we always do this stuff in vivo as well. So, and, and that can be um, frankly pretty expensive and pretty time consuming, but um, you know, we're trying to do it more and more where we'll take the same, you know, not, not during a screen per se, although we do have one of those papers that we're also writing right now, but um, you know, not doing a screen most of the time, but do you take a winning particle and you wanna see how it goes in? And so then you put it into wild type mice, X knockout, Y knockout, Z knockout, mice and then you see where it goes down um and so doing that we have found um uh different uh pathways but again it just depends on the particle thanks it's it's tough though. i have to be honest it's tough like the, the 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 particle mechanism stuff um to do it rigorously with appropriate controls and in vivo and sort of convincingly is I, I, in my opinion actually quite hard um, so it's always a slog. Whenever we start down one of those roads, my students know that we're 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 in for a slog at that point. Poor student. Yeah, I know. 
Yeah, I, the last thing the last thing I'll say is that my you know you hear these talks and my, all the students I have this, I can't tell you many times I've had this happen. A student joins the lab, they're all jazzed up because they, they love the barcoding idea, blah blah blah. And I'm like, all right, that's great. So like today you need to make 200 particles, and then they go. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's awesome. It's always a slog. It's always a slog. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. This is great.